Okay, so uh, today we're going to look at uh, just a little bit of uh, proof of the x's. We're going we're to discuss the x's, and, and the problem is, is that any discussion on the x's is a little bit hard, a little bit hard to have any kind of a real dialogue going, um, because it's been so tainted uh, by by people who don't love history and people who don't love learning. You've got religious people on one side that will seize any, any evidence, no matter how far-fetched, even evidence that's not really evidence, it's just something that's been made up and posted online. Like, we found the remains of the, you know, uh, Egyptians, uh, soldiers in the Red Sea or something, and you know, stuff like that. And then it starts making its round online, and then all credibility is lost. And then on the other side, you have people who deny the exodus for no good reason. And no evidence will ever be good enough for them because they've already decided the exodus did not happen. It doesn't matter what history, what actually happened. They don't care. All that they care is that they don't believe in the exodus, so therefore the exodus didn't happen. Um, but that's not really a good way to approach study. As a historian, you have to approach everything as with skepticism, but healthy skepticism. What do I mean by that? I mean by there should be doubt in your mind that it happened exactly as recorded, but that doesn't mean that no evidence should ever convince you. There's a point where skepticism goes to the extreme and nothing is good enough. But I would like to challenge you, if you're one of those people who no evidence is good enough, well then the same thing could be said against evolution. I mean, sometimes people look for evidence that couldn't exist. And so really, we have to really change how we're going to look at this if we're actually going to make any kind of progress. So let's not dismiss events out of hand. Let's actually have a, health, have a healthy dialogue here. First off, there's the dating problem. In a recent documentary uh, by, um, I want to say it was by Mahoney, it was called Patterns of Evidence, and it was looking at uh, the different um, evidences for the Exodus. And one of the things that it brought up was an Egyptologist by the name of David Roll. Now, David Roll believes that um, all of the dating is wrong and needs to be moved not by just five or ten years by hundreds of years obviously you should see the problems with this <laughs> a lot of really smart people have been working for a lot of a lot of years to get a good chronology going and to just hey let's just move that it seems a little bit far-fetched now I honestly think that David Roll's solution causes more problems than it does resolves problems. If he is right, which I find very improbable, there's just not the evidence to support it yet. It's, it's an interesting theory, but it's an unnecessary theory. See, he says, because I think this happened here, therefore we have to move the dates. It doesn't really add up. Now, he's got a lot of information out there if you want to look him up. I'm just going to go ahead and say that that's – I don't think that that's necessary. The next thing is people say, okay, well, the, well if the exodus happened, it happened in the 1200s under uh, Pharaoh Ramses. Well, there's a big problem with this too. First off, there's really no evidence of this happening at that time. And more so than that… It ha this is much later than the Bible itself says that events happened. So that takes us to the traditional dating. Now, if you're really a stickler and you count things out, it seems to add up to the date of 1446 BC. Uh, and so the traditional date is that. But I would argue for a different date because of a few different things. First off, the Bible is very rarely uh, precise about numbers, especially further back. Um, I think that we need to be careful with any ancient history establishing a specific date unless it is just 
beyond the realm of error, which, if you know anything about history, there's very little that's beyond the realm of, 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 of error. I mean, er it's... History is, is, is very... It's a house of cards. And it's very touchy. And you just got to be careful when you're rooting around in history. So I would argue for anywhere really in the 1450 to 1500s range. So then the question becomes, do we find any evidence for an exodus, exodus in that range? And you might say, well, where do you get that range? And where do you get that date range from? Well, when you take into, into account that the numbers weren't exact, when you take into account that... Um, there is room for error with how people have added the dates um, in Chronicles and Kings and that kind of stuff. There's room for error there. And so uh, taking, a, taking out the precision of 1446 and putting in the more likely approach of this date range, which we're only talking about a 50-year 50, 50 date range. I'm not talking about changing the whole world here. Um, it's possible that the date of Solomon's temple might be off a little bit. Typically, that um, people have said that Solomon built his temple in 971, but once again, there is some error, room for error there. And if you just give it a 30-year leeway there, that'll take us about to the same to the same um, event here. Now, the Bible says it was 480 years. Once again, that shouldn't be taken precisely because they didn't count precisely back then. People didn't write back then how they write now. So if we say around uh, 480 years from the time that Solomon built his temple and 970 to 1000, somewhere in that date range there, a 30-year leeway, that takes us to about 1450 to, five, uh, to 1500. Now, if we ask the question, does there exist in this date range any kind of evidence for the Exodus? We actually have just an abundance of evidence. Now, before I get going on the actual evidence, it is worth saying that it, the Israelites observe Passover. I mean, you can't simply deny a historical claim that has so firmly founded an entire culture just because it doesn't suit you. Now, once again, that might not seem like it's evidence. I get that, and so we're, I'm not really going to highlight this very, very strongly. But it does, it does need to be mentioned that <laughs> that if they observe something, it, it stands to reason that it came from something. You really can't get an entire people to celebrate something that didn't happen. I mean, think about, you know, if Americans celebrated July 4th when there was no independence. Why why would we say that that event did not happen simply because it's been a long time since it happened? So, I mean, so, now onto the actual proof. Do we find any evidence of an exodus in the date range, date range of 1500 to 1450? Yes, we do. There is a pharaoh named Tuthmosis II, who died quite suddenly in 1479, with cysts on him like boils, exactly in the date range that the Bible says it happened, and he got exactly the injury that he it says that he had. So, okay, maybe it was just a one-time thing. Well, when we compare... Um, Tethmosis II with other people who were alive at, in the court at the time. We see that other people contracted this illness as well, but they had time to heal. Tethmosis II, however, did not have time to heal. He died when the wounds were fresh, which argues that he got the boils like the Bible said, and then as he was pursuing uh, the Israelites to the Red Sea, that he died quite suddenly in the Red Sea, and his body washed onto the shore. Once again, this is exactly as the Bible describes it. So that in itself should cause us to pause for a minute, because we have exactly in the date range a pharaoh that meets the description. Now, that kind of at this point we should probably ask a very simple question has the bible proven historically reliable in other areas and the answer is yes yes it has in many different areas there's been entire books written about the historical contributions of the bible i mean the bible was affirming things before we even knew anything 
And now, as much as we know, it's been said that we know less than 1% of what's out there in archaeology. That's, that's a big statement. And I think that sometimes people get a little bit too confident in the little bit of knowledge that we have. And that's just not smart. So, then we have the problem, okay, what about his descendant? Because we know that the Bible claims that Teth Moses II's uh, son died, or oldest son. Well, recently it's come to light that Teth Moses III, who followed Teth Moses II, not directly his wife, a cheap set, took over, but the next male descendant, uh, may not have been related. Um, based on DNA evidence, that's up in the air. Um, furthermore, even if he was related, it's not it's not clear that he was actually the one who was supposed to inherit the throne. Um, once again, Egyptian history is a little bit mm, not as precise as we would like, but once again, there is definitely something there. Now, I'm not going to stay with absolute certainty on this point because, like I say, we don't we just don't know yet. But that's what how it seems to be going. So then um, we have the problem. Okay, so. Tethmosis II died quite suddenly with these wounds that are exactly what the Bible describes, okay? So his wife, Hatshepsut, takes over. Now, historians kind of think that she was kind of running the show while Tethmosis II was still alive anyways, so might not have been that big of a change. But uh, it was him who went out and died, and it wasn't her, so I think that that, you know, might be something. Um, so Hatshepsut... Uh, really just a very interesting pharaoh um, was a woman obviously and started changing her image um, as her reign went on to appear more like a man uh, and calling herself you know the son of the pharaoh and stuff now when she died um, a lot of her inscriptions were just erased for no good reason and now a lot of people will say it was because she was a female pharaoh but she wasn't the f first female pharaoh and that seems like it's more of a modern issue it seems like we're kind of trying to answer an unanswerable an question by looking back while taking note of our own history so i mean let's take that with a grain of salt so you have a cheap set whose whose image is marred after she's died doesn't really make sense there but let's not get it let's not you know get too off there um when, when Tethmosis the Third took over after her death, um, it didn't seem like there was any conflict between them. But then he started claiming her inscriptions as his own, and people seemed to be okay with it, which kind of brings a question as to why. But anyways, Hatshepsut writes that there were some vagabonds in uh, the north of Egypt, around the Goshen area, who ruined Egypt. They were the ones responsible for the tragedy during Tuthmosis II's reign. Now, she doesn't really elaborate what is that big event that happened. She doesn't really say, just, she just says that it left Egypt in ruins. Now, we know that it wasn't the Hyksos, because the Hyksos had, had been driven out of Egypt in 1550. But apparently, there was some people who were left over afterwards. Now these are the people that she's referencing. Now once again, if we know that they aren't they aren't Huxos, and we know that they were similar, you know, Semitic, that they were Semitic people, and it just kind of begs the question: Who were these people if they weren't the Israelites? And it's right at the time that the Bible says it happened. So there's that. Um, also, we have the very big issue of reduced conquests. There's no reason why Egypt should have backed off so strongly and had cheap set double down. She just started building stuff and didn't even focus on conquest. And just why would she have suddenly changed that? I mean, it just doesn't follow. For 22 years, no conquest. Unless a large portion of their army was wiped out and I don't know the Red Sea. Well, now we have a reason as to why they would back off for, for this period and why they would allow themselves to be seen as weak for this period. But it doesn't stop there. See, Hatshepsut, as the next pharaoh, 
was basically the next in God line. Okay, the pharaohs claimed to be God, and so for her to be after him would meant would mean that it was a continuity. It really wasn't so much a new pharaoh as a continuing pharaoh. The ruler is the god, but. That's not how Hatshepsut portrayed it. In fact, she distanced herself from Tuthmosis II and kind of seemed to be talking down about him. Which doesn't really follow. Because that would have destroyed her own credibility unless it was a greater risk to claim him and to claim what he had done than it was... See what I mean? Unless it was a greater risk. So she came to the conclusion that it was more risky claiming that most was saying than it was dis distancing herself from him. With once again, once again, kind of leaves us with some questions, which the, I think the Exodus really answers. Um, also, we have a major religion shift. See, during the time of Tethmos II, Amun Ra, that's 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 the head honcho god. Okay. Well, now after Tethmos II. We have Aten slowly rising to dominance. And this rise to dominance lasts from the 1400s all the way into the, thir into the 1300s when a pharaoh actually renames himself Aken Aten, um, you know, and, 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 and goes as near to monotheism as possible <laughs> without... Uh, really arriving at the destination, and yet at his death, Egypt instantly reverted back. Now, if we look over and say, okay, what was happening in the 1300s? We see Israel was coming out as a full-fledged nation in the land of Canaan. So before you say, well, hold on, the Israelites were just Canaanites, and hold on, just hold on. Okay, we are seeing that there is reasonable doubt. Now. There is no mention of Israel in Canaan before the Bible says that they were there. When Egypt talks about Canaan, they never talk about Israel. It's never it, they just aren't it just doesn't exist. And so that kind of leaves us with the question as to why all of a sudden do we have them mentioning Israel in Canaan in the 1200s if they were there the whole time? Kind of, kind of. Granted, there could be stronger evidence, but still, it's worth considering. Then there, we have another problem: the DNA evidence has connected Canaanites with modern-day people of Lebanon. So now we have an even bigger rift of the assumption that Israel was always there. Uh, furthermore, why would they have written the Bible? To help them get some kind of a claim on the land when the Bible clearly said, I will not drive the people out before you in Judges, and you will not get full dominance over the land. It clearly says that in Judges. So why would they have written a book that would have taken away their credibility on the land? Second off, if they were trying to say, we, we deserve this land and that's why we're taking this from you. Why would they have said that their ancestor was a nobody who came from Mesopotamia? Why would that have ever even entered the equation? Why would they have gone to the trouble of inventing some myth about being in Egypt when, I mean, the Canaanites were there, they would have known that they weren't really in Egypt. Why would they have done that? And then why would the entire nation have claimed that this happened and then observed the Passover when it didn't even happen. That just leaves more questions than it answers. And I'm concerned that the modern day approach of just simply dismissing it because it's in the Bible is just woefully inadequate. So let's get back to this. Now, if we assume that 1479 was when the Israelites left, uh, left Egypt, Okay, so we know that they spent 40 years in the wilderness. That takes us to about 1439. Uh, okay, so now we're in the 1430s. And we have the Amarna letters. Now, the Amarna letters are uh, written uh, from the kings of Canaan to the Egyptian pharaoh, saying about different things that are going on, problems, you know, warfare and stuff, and, and talking about people who are coming in and attacking. Now, sadly... 
at the same time that Israel was getting ready to start their conquest of the Promised Land, um, there were other people attacking the Canaanites as well. So not everyone in the Amarna letters were um, Israelite. However, some of them must have been. <laughs> because if you take into account the fact that the book of Joshua took a long time to do the conquest. And when you take into account how they wrote back then, and when you take into account that it's exactly at the same time, it's just too big of a coincidence. And then you have Akhenaten, once again, who's going all monotheistic for no apparent reason, other than Israel claiming a one God left and ended up in the promised land and they're actually getting victories and so then an Akhenaten over here hey you know we need to get up on this power here so then he, he tries this big this big move it just makes sense now granted that's a lot of speculation however it just makes sense so when, when we get to the conquest we see that Israel didn't conquer the whole land they conquered the whole area now what I mean by that is the Bible says that they kept returning back to the Jordan and they only conquered a few cities, namely Ai and Jericho. Now we know that Jericho was destroyed sometime around this time. It's hard to be precise. Um, it was originally dated to about 14, you know, 50 or whatever. But then, it, but then um, I believe it was, I want to say it was Kenyan redated. It said that it was much earlier that it was destroyed. <coughs> well, here's the problem. If it was destroyed much earlier, she didn't. She didn't excavate the whole site. She did really good on a few key locations, so her observations were not without error, and she could have been wrong. What we what we need to do is go back and reanalyze the site because one small uh, thing. If you look up her methods, she didn't do wide like other people did. She took one place and went straight down, and. So obviously that left that leaves a lot of questions. Now, a lot of the answers aren't necessarily answerable because of erosion and those kinds of things. But still, the dating of Jericho could prove that um, Tethmosis II was the pharaoh of the Egypt uh, of the Exodus. So we look in Joshua and we look in Judges and we see that a they didn't conquer the whole land. When it says they conquered the whole land, it's it mean it's a it's a way that they wrote in ancient times. It means they pacified the area. Also, we know that it says that they burned uh, um, Hazor and they burned um, one more, but they didn't go around burning a bunch of places. And the reason why is because they were supposed to take over the towns and live in them. If they burned them all down, they would have had nowhere to live. The Bible clearly says that. The only reason why they completely destroyed Jericho was because it was the first city of the conquest. Um, and then besides that, um, when you look at it, you can see that they didn't destroy the places completely anyways. We know that because in Joshua it says that they were attacking a city, and then they attacked the same city again in Judges. Now, either they were aware that they were lying, and they didn't even try to cover up their lies, or the more obvious solution, that's how they wrote back then. I mean, we see this in, in ancient documents all the time. I, we completely destroyed them. Translation, we beat them in battle. See, the problem is, is that modern people want ancient writers to write how they think now, but that's just not how it works. So we have the Amarna letters, which, at least in part, probably reference the, the Israelite um, uh, conquest. We have the uh, Amun-Ra's downfall and Aten's rise. We have had Sheepset uh, claiming that there were vagabonds in the north that, that caused the problem that were not the Huxos. We have Thutmose II with the marks on him, dying right around the same period. Then we have a document uh, from the 1400s. Now this is just shortly after um, Israel has left Egypt, referring to, to Israel as the Shasu of Yahweh. Now, or the Shasu of the land of, of Yahweh. But the, either way, the, the point remains valid. Um, I believe this was in an inscription, I want to say in Soleb. Um, Shasu basically means nomad or, or wanderer, or desert wanderer. And Yahweh has only ever been connected with one group of people, Israel.
Now, some people would try and say, oh, it was a Can Yahweh was a Canaanite deity. There is absolutely no proof of that claim. There is no proof of any other people in Canaan worshiping Yahweh. There is no be before the Exodus. Now, I'm not saying that hypothetically a people couldn't have tried to adopt Yahweh among their other gods. That may have happened. Absolutely. In fact, we even see that in the Bible. The Israelites tried to worship Yahweh and other gods. So I'm not trying to make that claim. But I'm saying before the Exodus, the god Yahweh appears out of thin air. He, he was n nowhere. I mean, all the other gods were... I mean, even his character comes out of nowhere. He has some things that relate to some of the bells, for instance. But the core of his personality is completely different. Um, for instance... A lot of his distaste about sexual sexual immorality and, and stuff, th these are things that were just completely like, what? When the entire culture accepts something and you make a claim that is against all of that, we need to stop and ask, okay, where the heck did that, did that come from? And I think that John Oswald has a really great start if you want to uh, catch up on this more. It's The Bible Among the Myths by John Oswald. Check it out. Um, it's not the most thorough book. It's a very short book, but it's 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 a very much a worth the read. And basically, the idea of the book is this: that um, there are similarities between the Bible and the ancient world. Obviously, it was written at that time, but there's way more differences, and similarities don't mean the same. And just all, it's just I don't want to give away the ending. It's just a great book. Anyways. So here we have an inscription of the Shasu of Yahweh. Now, he, here's a little bit telling, because what did the Egyptians call them? Nomads of Yahweh. Well, what land did they belong to? They didn't belong to any land. Had Sheepset, 50 years earlier, called them vagabonds, because they didn't belong to Egypt. Now, here they are getting ready to go into Canaan. They haven't conquered much of anything yet. And what does Egypt call them? Nomads of Yahweh. What were the two defining character traits of Israel at that time? Because they didn't have, they didn't have a homeland. They served Yahweh, and they were nomads. Now, some people will say, okay, well, maybe the Shasu of Yahweh are other people, like maybe the Edomites or something. In the same inscription, they refer to the Edomites, they refer to the other people, and then they also refer to the Shasu of Yahweh. Now, we know that they're not talking about the other people based on, we can compare with other lists, we can compare with people who were at the, at the places of the time. The only name that fits is Israel. And this was right at the time that they had not done their conquest yet. <coughs> so now we have Egypt themselves saying that they were vagabonds. At that time, 50 years earlier. Now we have, you know, uh, late 1400s, we have them talking about the Shasu of Yahweh, the nomads of Yahweh. And then, in the Merneptah it talks about Israel, now a nation, now in the land of Canaan, tw in the 1200s, on the Merneptah It talks about the people of Israel. Now we have them actually in Canaan, like the Bible says, and they've actually established themselves as a presence, just like the, the Bible says. Now, we don't know what the conflict was that, that Egypt got in with Israel in the 1200s, but it's worth noting that they didn't touch Israel. For Let's do a little bit of math here. Let's just say 1450, 1350, 1250. 250 years went by with Egypt not even trying to touch Israel. And then finally, we have one inscription of some kind of a skirmish in the 1200s. I think that that's worth warranting. Because like I said, Israel didn't exist as a nation in Canaan before that. And when we look at Canaanite culture, we see that Israelite really didn't share that much of Canaanite culture. Yes, they lived in similar houses at times. Why, why build a different house? Before Israel ended up in Canaan, they lived in tents. I mean, hey, it's a house. It's a house. But when we look at the big picture here, Israelite pottery is very bland. Canaanite pottery is very elaborate. DNA doesn't place Israel as the Canaanites. 
So where did they come from? If they didn't come from Canaan, where did they come from? The only claim that is ever made in history is that Israel came from Exodus, uh, Egypt. So if there is no historical claim that they ever came from somewhere else and no proof that they ever came from anywhere else, we are left with the inconvenient truth that they most likely came from Egypt. We can place Semitic people in Egypt at the time that the Bible says they were there. We have their names on slave lists. We have their, their graves. We see that they lived, that they definitely lived there. And not all of those can, can only be attributed to the Hyksos. It was the Hyksos. Yes, some of them obviously were the Hyksos. However, to say that all of them were the Hyksos is very misleading. So we have a little bit of a, of a problem, and the big problem is that people don't actually read the account in Exodus, and then they just kind of run wild with it. So, so hey, let's talk about some, some, some misunderstandings. First off, there's, a, there's an, Egypt, an Egyptian writing called the Ipawar Papyrus, and it talks about the Niles of the, the rivers, the water of the Nile running red. Now, some people have said this is proof of the Exodus. No, it's not. First off, it was written way too early way too early. Second off, although it does mention the Nile turning to, turning red, it also mentions a bunch of other things that never happened in Exodus. So saying yes, there's this one thing that seems a little bit similar to Exodus means that the whole thing is the same. No. No. As far as history is concerned, the Ipur Papyrus is mostly irrelevant to Exodus. Now, it might have been that God used um, a sign that f the Pharaoh would have understood, that's that's plausible. But to say that it was an account of the Exodus is just not, not likely. Another common misconception is that the Israelites did a lot of building. They didn't do a whole lot of building in, e in Egypt. They didn't build the pyramids. Uh, the pyramids were around way before Israel ever even got there. So let's keep that in, in, in mind. <coughs> There was proof found in the Red Sea. Okay, A, first off, we don't even know where in the Red Sea that they crossed. So finding proof is going to be a little bit hard when we don't even know the location. Do you know how much water and sand there is to sift through? It's just very unlikely. Second off, the chances that, is, that Egypt left their um, all their stuff in the water to just rot is just, I find, very unlikely. They probably went back and salvaged it. I mean... What would you do if you just lost a bunch of chariots? Would you go salvage it so that you could remake more chariots so you wouldn't be left completely defenseless? Or would you just leave it to rot in the, rot in the water? Well, gee, that's real hard. Furthermore, we have Tuthmosis of Sengen's body, meaning that they recovered it. And if they recovered the body of one, doesn't it stand to reason that they might have recovered the body of more? Doesn't that just make sense? So will we find proof of the Exodus in... The waters of the Red Sea. Well, let me think. Probably no. Probably no. I mean, this is just off the top of my head. Now, there is the off chance that we might find something, but probably no. So that leaves us with what kind of evidence are we actually looking for to validate the, the, the Exodus? What kind of proof are we looking for? We know that a lot of the evidence that people are supposedly looking for just isn't going to happen. There, we're not going to find some Egyptian exodus. We're not going to find that. We will find hints to things. An event as big as that wouldn't have been able to just be brushed away. But why, oh why, would a pharaoh say, yeah, they schooled us. We got, we got really bad wiped out. And our gods are fake. Why would they have possibly said something like that? It would have been Egyptianized to, to downplay it. Which is exactly what we see between Hatshepsut and Tuthmosis II. Um, also, there's the issue of where was Israel. Well, at the end of at the end of Genesis, they were in Goshen. That's at the beginning. They were nomads. But then the situation quickly changes. It says that they were enslaved, meaning that they lived among the Egyptians. And as far as we can tell, they took up Egyptian culture. They lived in their houses. They dressed like them. In fact, they dressed like them all the way up until they were in the desert. And in the desert, they made themselves a calf, a golden calf. And because of that event that happened 
um, Moses took it and, 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 and burned it down and, and, they, and they drank the water and all that. It's recorded in Exodus. Uh, it says because of that, they stopped wearing that. They stopped dressing like Egypt, finally, after they worshipped other gods and it didn't work out for them. So when we look for evidence of them in the promised land, I mean, in, in Egypt, we don't need to look for, you know, these big cities and stuff. They lived in tents or they lived in the Egyptian houses, two places that they lived. Now, they moved in before the Hyksos, and we see that in the beginning of Exodus. It says, let's enslave them lest they join with these other people. Who were the other people that they would have joined with? The Hyksos. And their fear, the Pharaoh's fear was actually pretty well placed. The Hyksos were a threat, obviously. Now, the Hyksos didn't take over all at once. They gradually moved in, exactly like Exodus describes it. Israel moved in, and then other people moved in slowly, and then eventually they just started taking stuff over. Now, as they took it over, where, what happened What happened to the Israelites when the Hyksos were in? Well, some of them were still in the north, some of them were among the Hyksos, and some of them moved down south. Now, how do we know that they moved down south? Well, because it says that Moses' mother put him in the Nile, and the Nile runs towards the Mediterranean, so it's not like it could have run, run south. But it ended up at the, at the Pharaoh's palace, which was down south, not up north. Even after the Hyksos were destroyed in 1550 by uh, Pharaoh Amos, their main headquarters was still farther south. And yet, Moses ended up at the Pharaoh's court, which implies that the Israelites were down south at this point. So in other words, as the Hyksos moved in and started taking stuff over, the Pharaohs moved down south, and a large portion of the Israelites moved down south with them. Okay, well now we have a little bit more of an understanding. We're not going to be able to find much evidence but to distinguish them from the Hyksos, admittedly, but for good reason. <coughs> now, what did they build? They only ever built two minor constructions. See, what people, what the Bible says is that they built a storehouse in what would be Pi Ramses. What people interpret that to say is that they built the entire city of Ramses. No, they did not build the entire city of Ramses. They built a storehouse in northern Egypt, either for maybe for Pharaoh Amos or maybe for the Hyksos, that was, or maybe before the Hyksos ever, were ever there. We don't really know. That was just a storehouse. That was it. Now, at that place, it would later be called Ramses. That doesn't mean that they built Ramses. Now, this is a very common common thing that happens in the Bible and in other ancient literature where they will substitute the name for what it would be known as later. We see this in Genesis, for instance. It says that Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldeans, but Ur wasn't known as Ur of the Chaldeans at the time of Abraham or for hundreds of years afterwards. So we're left with the problem of why, why is it called Ur of the Chaldeans when that didn't exist back then? Because later editors would come and they would edit Things. Now, we know that the Bible was written – maybe that's a different discussion. But um, basically what we have is we have them updating the names like they did often. Why, oh why – excuse me. Why, oh why should we take that to then say that it had to – happened 1,200 years later when the Bible says that happened in, in the 14, 1500s? Why would, why would we do that? There's no logical reason for that. So – now that we actually put that in context, well, is there something below Ramses? Well, there's Avaris. Avaris is on the same place as, as uh, Ramses, and it's being excavated. It has been being excavated for a long time. And uh, so there's that. Now, could they have built Avaris? Yeah, it's possible, but once again, the Bible doesn't say that they built Avaris. It says that they built a storehouse. A storehouse. Now, also next is that people think that they built, did a lot of building out of bricks made with straw. This is not what the Bible said either. So let's put a little bit of chronology. First off, they, they built the storehouses, and then it says that they uh, become slaves. They start serving in the field and taking care of the crops and those kinds of things. And it says that they also built brick at that time, after the storehouses were already, already built. So we can't look for storehouses made of brick with straw because they didn't start building the brick with straw until afterwards. In fact, we don't even know that the Egyptians did anything with the brick after they had them make them. 
it seems very possible that they had them build the brick and then just threw the brick away. Why? To keep them busy. The whole reason for the exercise was to keep the Israelites from rebellion. They already had to deal with the Hyksos. They didn't want another bigger problem. So they had them doing this construct and doing building bricks all day. That's all. It never says they did anything with the brick. Never once does it say that. It never says that they did a whole bunch of building projects. It never says that. It says that they built two storehouses, one in Ramses, one in Pithom. We don't know where the Pithom is. Uh, and Ramses, like I said, could have been updated to a more modern name, so there's no reason in assuming that they built the whole city of Ramses or that Ramses was ever even there when they built the city. Storehouse. So now that we've got a little bit of perspective on these things and we can see past the things that people have just invented, let's keep going. Egypt never recorded a defeat. Ever. Why should we accept uh, we should why should we expect them to record the Exodus? Hey, let's write down a time that we got our butts kicked. And it might have been a god. Israel was was convinced that it was a god. I don't know if Egypt was or not, but either way, they downplayed it. That's what they would have done. To say that the exodus, the, the exodus didn't happen because Egypt doesn't say, hey, the exodus happened, is so unhistorical and so biased and so ignorant of history that it, it honestly pains me when people use that argument. Because Egypt didn't say that there was an exodus, there was no exodus. That's got to be one of the stupidest arguments I've ever heard. Anyways, furthermore, any time any serious student of history and archaeology has to be honest with the evidence, and the honest answer is that there are so many restrictions. We are held so far short. There's so little that we know, so very little that we know about ancient history. It is so unbelievable. The tiny amount that we know compared to what we know is out there, and then there might be stuff that we don't even know is out there. We know less than I believe it was. Um, McLaren, I want to say, who said this? Don't don't quote me on that. But oh, I wish I could remember for sure. Either way, a well-known uh, uh, archaeologist, whoever he may be, <laughs> uh, said that we know less than one percent, and he wa he did some five thousand mounds, and there was less than one percent that he felt confident about. Wow. Now, when you when you take and look at how many mounds there are in that little area, how much we don't know. Consider that we didn't even know about Babylon until a couple hundred years ago. Babylon was a major superpower, and we didn't even know that they existed. That's a that's a pretty big statement. So then we look for proof that doesn't exist or couldn't possibly exist. And because we can't find that proof, we deny the Exodus out of hand. Well, I don't want the Bible to be true, so the Exodus didn't happen. Well, the, the Egyptians didn't say, hey, the Exodus is true, so therefore it didn't exist. You can't look for proof that couldn't possibly exist. Well, we would have found some evidence of them living in Goshen. Okay, they were nomads. They lived in tents. They reused everything. They didn't just break stuff. The only reason why we can date cities by pots, by pot breaking, pot shards is what they're called, is because there was a city that lived in one place and there's not much you can do about a clay pot breaking. But nomads didn't use those things, they were too big and luggy. So here we have nomads living in the north. What are you looking for out there? We're not going to find any evidence of a nomad living there. It's like saying go walk the dunes of the Arabian Desert and tell me if you find any proof of, of nomads living there. What? That's got to be one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. And we're not going to find any proof of them living among the Egyptians because they took up Egyptian culture. They would have looked like Egyptians. They would have been buried like Egyptians. They would have lived like Egyptians. There's no reason to assume that we'll ever find evidence. We'll, we'll find evidence in the desert. A, once again, we have no idea where in the desert to even begin looking. And it's a really big desert. And besides that, what would we find out there? Their valuables they wouldn't have thrown on the dirt? 
they aren't, they aren't wasteful like we are here in the Western world in the modern day. They've reused everything. They didn't have a bunch of pots that they could have just brought around and broken in random spots so that we could find pots. Even if they did, a lot, a lot of the pots that we find in, in, in cities, they're around like something where there's something keeping it there. If it was just out in the dunes, what's to keep a sandstorm from covering it up? I mean, let's use our brain here. They're, we're looking for evidence that doesn't exist. But if we look at the documentation of Egypt, the documentation of Israel, if we look at what the evidence actually claims, there is sufficient reason to have to believe in an exodus of some kind beyond reasonable doubt. Now, you don't have to believe that the Bible happened exactly how it said. I'm not trying to convert you to Christianity here. What I am trying to say is that there is sufficient enough evidence to believe that there was some form of an exodus. And it was not the Hoxos leaving. It happened after that. Now, we do know that supernatural events do happen and they have been scientifically observed. Um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, for instance, uh, wrote an entire book about his observances with the supernatural that were all well documented with many witnesses. Um, there have been doctors who have written books about supernatural events happening in uh, hospital rooms. Um, there have been near-death experiences. Now, granted, I'm not saying every single one of them is true, but you cannot scientifically dismiss every claim because it doesn't suit what you want to happen. I mean, I don't know how better to say that. We can't just simply deny the claim that something supernatural happened just because we don't believe in the supernatural. I don't believe in the supernatural, therefore it couldn't have happened. Well, that's not scientific. Science looks at it, and it tries to give an explanation. So here we have an entire group of people, the Israelites, who believed that this is what happened. I don't think that that's what happened. Okay, fine. So give us an alternate theory. But you cannot just simply dismiss a historical account just because you don't like it. Okay, so let's keep things in perspective here. Any honest, serious story, uh, student of history or archaeology needs to accept that the events of the Exodus probably did happen. Maybe not in the exact same way. Okay, I will give you some leeway here. But there needs to be some kind of a, some kind of evidence given as to why it's not believed in, or to somehow invalidate it because there was a historical claim that something did happen. So even if the story was exaggerated, the outline is still possible. So that takes us to the question I started at the beginning: Did the Exodus really happen? Well, when we look at all the proof, it's quite possible that it did happen, and it seems to fit the evidence best. Do we have 100% definitive evidence? Well, if you deny the Bible, if you deny the Passover, if you deny the Egyptian accounts, then I guess your answer is no. But, once again, that level of skepticism really isn't warranted. It really isn't warranted. And just because Egypt, Israel claimed that a god had an interaction with their life is also not proof that it didn't happen. I mean, the Babylonians claim the same thing. Oh, the, the god Marduk did this. Well, attributing something to a god, it, if you took away all history that, that did that, there'd be very few accounts that you actually could use. And most of them would be from merchants about how much of something that they sold. Sold. So, when we look at it, we can say, here's the scale. Here's 100% Proof. This would be we saw with our own eyes. Here's no, it didn't happen. This is 100% no, it did not happen. There's no proof of it happening. The Israelites do not celebrate Passover. The Exodus, the book of Exodus was not written. Uh, you know, all this stuff. It just didn't happen. So here's about the midway point. We are somewhere around here. No, we cannot physically observe the Exodus ever happening. But there is enough evidence to give beyond reasonable skepticism, the idea that it probably did happen. So I hope that this was kind of enlightening for you. Um, I saw that documentary Patterns of Evidence, and I did not agree with a lot of, a lot of it. it. It was a good starting point. It was good to get the dialogue going. But we can't stop there. We can't stop there. So 